on today's show. It's your Houston Rockets end of season award show. Who is the Houston Rockets MVP this year? What about defensive player of the year, sixth man of the year, rookie of the year, most improved player, as well as a couple non-traditional ones, the unsung hero award and the dog of the year. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, Nidfistonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcast, including YouTube, where the best way you can help the show out is to comment anything below. I'm going to drop a template for the awards ballot in the YouTube comments. I want you to copy that, paste it, and select your own awards for each category for this Houston Rockets season. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Look, I'll admit it, I have a bit of of a uh, competitive side, if you will. A lot of us do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer and making the show part of your day every single day. Joining us now is none other than your weekly co-host, the Podfather himself, Rockets Wire editor and host of the Logger Line podcast, Ben Dubose. You can track down on Twitter at Ben Dubose. Here for our end of season Houston Rockets award show, where we will anoint the traditional awards like MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, all that good stuff, as well as a couple fun ones here. We've got the Unsung Hero Award and the Dog of the Year Award, as well as we have to anoint our Locked On Rockets player of the year. We're going to get to all of that on today's episode. And it'll be really fun to see how, you know, how Ben's mind kind of looks at some of these awards, how I'm looking at some of these awards and what overlap, if any, that we may have between these awards. So Ben, we got to start with the big one right out of the gate, MVP. And I'm going to let you do the honors here. You can tee us off. Who's your MVP pick for this year's Houston Rockets? It was close between Alper and Shingoon and Fred Van Vliet, but I'm going to go with Fred Van Vliet simply because I think a couple of important tiebreakers go to Fred. When you look at the advanced metrics, depending on which you choose, there are some that favor LP. There are some that favor Fred. To me, the biggest tiebreaker is that when you consider where the Rockets are at as an organization, this season was never just about wins and losses. It's about building the right habits. It's about transitioning from phase one of the rebuild to phase two. And so I'm giving some deference to Fred based on not just the numbers he puts in game in, game out, but also the leader he is on and off the court. We've heard all the young guys, most notably LP, reference that time and time again, not just talking about Fred, the facilitator, although that certainly helps getting him the ball in the right spots, but also the leadership qualities that they go beyond just being a point guard and honestly being a true professional now in his thirties and the impact he has in showing these young guys how to prepare themselves, how to play, how to be a professional at the highest level. Fred is the first guy that comes out of all the young guys mouths when you ask them about that. And so when you have a season where you jump from 22 wins to 41, I think you have to give some deference when we talk about a tiebreaker to a guy who is basically a coach on the floor. It's Ime Udoka and Fred Van Fleet that are the leaders of this organization. And so if it's at all close, which I think it is between all P's numbers and Fred, then I give some deference to Fred simply based on what he means as a leader and all the intangibles he brings to this organization. A couple other small things I would point to durability. Fred played 73 games, all P 63. That's not a huge gap. And it's certainly not Shingun's fault that he got hurt. However, when you're trying to distinguish between two very comparable players, which most of the advanced metrics paint them as, then an extra 10 games does help. Now, again, that's if the players are close. I know you can also argue, well, Jalen Green played all 82 games. Yeah, that's true. And that helped. But I don't think the advanced metrics paint it as anything close for the season as a whole between Fred and Jalen. They do between Fred and all P. So those extra 10 games, I do think that, you know, nudges at least me a little bit more in the Fred camp. The last point I would get to is scalability. Look, we know when the Rockets signed Fred last offseason, a big part of the thinking for a rough for Rafael Stone in the front office was that as the years progress, you can gradually taper him off and reduce his role into something a bit more complimentary off the ball, spacing the floor as your young guys 
all P Jalen and men Thompson become capable of taking on greater scoring and playmaking roles as the years progress. So next year and the years beyond that, there's going to be plenty other opportunities for guys like Shingun or Jalen or a men, whoever it may be to win MVP. And my guess is that Fred's role goes down a little bit. This is probably the one year that I think you can argue for Fred. So let's give it to Fred now because those other guys, they'll have plenty of chances to win in the years ahead. That's my view. I think it's some absolutely fantastic points there when you look at Fred, and I agree. When you do start to dive into some of the numbers here, the eye test would tell you, and and we can sit here and agree, and there's a distinction between best player and most valuable player. And I think that's this is some of why sure. the the uh, the traditional word for the entirety of the NBA landscape is so kind of vague, right? It's intentionally vague. So you can get into these debates and these discussions and these talking points. But for the Rockets, I think it's without a doubt, Alperin Shagun was their best player, Fred was their most valuable player for all the reasons that you pointed out, the defense that he brought, the leadership, everything, and then setting the table, right? Al P probably still has a really successful, incredible year three, even if Fred Van Vliet doesn't exist on this Rockets team. But think about how much easier Fred made life for Alper and Shingun, right? Setting the table, putting him in spots to be successful. We saw the early chemistry develop between those two guys, and that's what allowed Al P to hit the ground running in such a big way here in year three. I would also point to... A pretty important statistic here, which is just raw plus minus numbers. Fred absolutely crushed it on the plus minus this year. He was a Rockets team best plus 183 for the entire season. That means the Rockets were plus 183 in the minutes that Fred played on the floor. And here's the thing. I know that there was like the super hot month of March. Al P didn't get to be a part of the win streak and everything. Even if you subtract March and, and the rest of the NBA season, so March and April, you get rid of those completely. Fred is still the raw plus minus leader for this Rockets team. Now, that's actually not 100% true. Tari Eason had a plus minus of 88, but Tari also only played, you know, 22 <laughs> games. So it's a little yeah. unfair to count that in the statistics. But Fred Van Vliet, plus minus 74 if you count him all the way through just up until March before the Rockets yeah. kind of took off and had that incredible month of March. Not to say that Shingun wasn't effective, wasn't useful, wasn't great in his own right, but his raw plus minus number is not nearly the same. And I think that paints the picture of this team succeeded when Fred was on the floor. Yeah, absolutely. A couple of other numbers I would point to. So what do guys like Alper and Shingun and Jalen Green need to produce at the highest level? More than anything, they need space. And for Fred Van Fleet to go out and shoot 39% on threes at high volume, averaging eight per game, that is absolutely massive. So he helped them from a spacing perspective. And then in terms of limiting turnovers, look, 8.1 assists to 1.7 turnovers per game. That's an assist to turnover ratio of almost five to one. Compare that to the Kevin Porter Jr. years where it felt like the Rockets were near the top of the league in turnovers every single year. That was a huge part of the Rockets shedding some of those bad habits and collectively getting out on the right foot. So just beyond the things we can talk about in terms of the leadership, the professionalism, when you look at the spacing and just taking care of the ball, those were little things that helped the Rockets beyond simply Fred the player, and it speaks to the tone, what he set for the collective as well. And the last thing I'll mention with Fred, and we saw this time and time again this season, he showed up when the Rockets needed him to so often, right? We, we, yeah. you know, it might have been a game where, where Fred, you know, was, you know, not non-existent for the first three quarters, but might have been struggling a little offensively, right? Still doing his job, still setting the table, still facilitating, being the leader on the floor, all of that. But when the going got tough, when they needed a bucket late, maybe maybe Al P didn't have it because of a certain matchup or was in foul trouble or maybe Jalen was struggling, whatever, Fred would be the guy to deliver repeatedly in crunch time in the fourth quarter, hitting big shots, keeping, you know, either keeping distance from the opposing team or helping the team dig themselves out of a hole. So a lot of credit for uh, Steady Freddy for guiding this Rockets team yep. this season. He is your Houston Rockets MVP this year. We want to know who your MVP is, though, and we want to know all your thoughts on all these awards. I'm going to drop the template, the awards ballot, if you will, in the YouTube comments, so be sure to let us know down there who you think should have been the MVP for this Houston Rockets season. Coming up, we've got all the other awards we're going to get to. Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, Most Improved Player, the Unsung hero the dog of the year and so much more here in just one moment first today's episode is brought to you by better help Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. And it's important to let that stuff out, especially to someone who's unbiased when it comes to your life. Look, I've done therapy in the past and I found it to be an incredibly cathartic experience to have an unbiased third party, to have a therapist help kind of walk me through some of the issues that I was dealing with. Maybe it was 
you know, a, an issue at work, right? You make a mistake or your boss chews you out or something. That doesn't feel good, right? And that stuff can wear on you. Or it could be something in your personal life, you know, a disagreement with a close friend or a loved one. And you don't want to harbor and bottle up those emotions because they can, you know, rear their ugly head at the wrong time. You have to work through and process those things in healthy ways. And look, therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than what's going on with our favorite sports teams. And it's important to get those things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, Ben, we handled MVP award. Let's go ahead and tackle Defensive Player of the Year award because this one, I, I had to sit here and think about it long and yeah. hard, but I came away and I settled on it has to go to a Min Thompson. I, I was really torn on this. Obviously, Dylan Brooks was the marquee, you know, one of the Rockets' marquee free agent acquisitions. He was supposed to be the Rockets' defensive ace, and he was for a chunk of the season. But I do think there was a little bit of regression from Dylan Brooks, kind of slipping into some some older habits, some bad tendencies, the fouling, you know, at, at questionable times. And it, he, it just kind of felt like he lost a little bit of a step as the season went along. Meanwhile, conversely, you look on the other end, Amin Thompson got nothing but better as the season went along, right? He is a completely different player from where the season started to where it ended. And I feel very confident and comfortable in saying that he is actually the Rockets best defender. Maybe there's an argument made for Tari Eason, but at least on this current roster of healthy players, he was the Rockets best defender by the end of the season. I think it would have been Tari Eason if he was healthy. Yeah. I think until the last 20 games, you could have made a case for Jabari Smith Jr. That tailed off late in the year, but it's not all his fault. Some of it had to do with him moving to center. And then the guys he's guarding, his assignment changed dramatically the last 20 games. I generally agree with you in terms of uh, a men being the most valuable defensively and certainly has the most upside moving forward. However, in the spirit of a more fun discussion, I'm going to pick someone different because I do think it's close. I'm going to go with Fred Van Fleet for defensive player of the year, because when you look at the consistent starters, he had the best defensive rating amongst those starters, again, excluding a men because he only started the last 20 or so games of the season. And for a young team, the stocks that Fred picked up, the steals or blocks, depending on how a scorer judged it on a given night, those were really huge. And when you look at the inconsistency of young guys like Jalen and Jabari, when you look at Dylan, who, despite being a veteran, was inconsistent himself, he also had the oblique injury. For Fred to give you what he gave you night after night, even though you know I mentioned Fred's durability, which was important, he had his own issues. He had issues with his back. He had the adductor strain. He was still out there for 73. could have been 75 games, if not for the healthy scratches at the end of the year. I think when you look at the defensive rating, when you look at the turnovers that he caused, you can make a case that for the full season, Fred might be or probably is your most valuable defensive player. Now, long term, it's a men over the last half of the season. It was definitely a men. But I think it's close enough that I'll go with Fred just so we have a different viewpoint here. OK, I like that. No, that, and, that, and that's good. And I think that's the that's one of the things that's so impressive about this Rockets team this year, finishing as the 10th best defense in the NBA. They had a lot of contributors to that defense, right? There could be arguments made across the board for a number of different players to have walked away with yeah. the defensive player of the year. Award. And the fact that we can even have a bit of a spirited debate yeah. about who and even, deserves it is yeah. impressive. And even though. And even though Fred is 30 years old and so he's not the on-ball guy that he used to be, he doesn't move as well side to side. At the same time, in a switching scheme where so much is about communication and talking, Fred is someone who's generally always aware he's in the right spots. He's setting the right example. So for the same reasons we laid out as Fred being MVP, he's also arguably MVP of your defense because he's setting the right tone for those other guys, particularly the young guys to follow. Absolutely. All right, let's move. Let's move on here. So we got MVP and DPOY out of the way. Rookie of the year. There are two options here, and I think one is probably the clear favorite between these. Yeah, pretty quick I'll be one. very quick with this one. It's a men for the reasons you just laid out. He was a defensive difference maker in year one, which is so hard to do at the NBA level. Look, I love Cam Whitmore, but it took him half the year to convince Ime Ujoka that he was worthy of a rotation spot. You can argue that maybe it should have been earlier, but facts are facts. He only played half the season as opposed to a men other than missing the 20 games early in the year with his ankle sprain. As soon as he went out there, he was a positive player defensively, which is really tough to do as a rookie. His handle got a little better as the year moved along. Off ball was way better than I thought it would be, and he proved viable as a front court starter. So for me, it's a slam dunk. And then Thompson's your rookie of the year, and I would argue that he should be all rookie first team for the league. 
I think there's a very strong chance that he is all rookie first team. At least I, I feel pretty confident in saying that. I can't. I I don't think I can sit here and comfortably name five rookies that were clearly better than a Min Thompson. I think he's clear in that top five. I think you got to probably look. At, it's got to be a Min Thompson, Chet Holmgren, Victor Wembanyama, Brandon Miller, and Brandon Pajemski, maybe possibly. Mm-hmm. He could be on there potentially. Maybe you make an argument, Scoot Henderson. The heat, he just got the reps. The guy for the Heat, uh, Jaime Hawkins. What's his name? I'm another one. On him. Yeah, Jaime yeah, Hawkins. yeah. That's there's another. There's another good yeah. one. I, I think. I think Amin is a lock for all rookie first team. I think Cam Whitmore might have his work cut out for him to make all rookie second team. Although I think there's a pretty strong likelihood that he makes that one as well. Let's roll into the most improved player discussion. And this is one Ben where I think that you know for anybody who was a little you know chagrined at. at Alper and Shingu not winning the MVP award for this team this year. I think Alp is the clear guy for the most improved player. When you look at where this, where he was last year and the role that he was given this year, how much you talked about scalability, right? His production going through the roof this season. I think there is an argument to be made maybe for Jabari Smith Jr., his improvement from year one to year two as the most improved player. But I just think when you look at everything that Shingun was asked to do and how he rose to the occasion, how he was this team's best player, his usage rating skyrocketed from about 21, uh, you know, uh, usage rating of 21% per night or per, you know, per game last year to just about 27.5% this season. He was the Rockets' leading scorer most nights. He was their best rebounder. He did things we haven't ever seen a, a, a third-year player do in the NBA. He played like, you know, baby Jokic, and that's what, part of the reason that's his nickname. Yeah. So I generally agree with you. However, just as I went with Fred for Defensive Player of the Year to give a different perspective, I'm actually going to throw a curveball here and go with Cam Whitmore simply because I'm moving the goalpost from most improved player, not just this season to last season, but start of this season to where they are now. And so when you look at the first half of this season, that Cam Whitmore, as mentioned in the rookie of the year discussion, couldn't convince Ime Udoka that he was worthy of minutes. He was just 19 years old, one of the youngest guys, not just in his draft class, in the entire NBA. And in his first 17 games, he was a negative 2.6 plus minus player. He averaged 0.3 assists in 14 minutes. The last 30 games, he shot 36% on threes on high volume. He was a positive plus minus player. Oh, and as far as the assist, his last three games of the year when he got to take on a higher workload with some of those veterans shutting down early, he averaged nearly five assists per game over the final three. So for the season as a whole, it's clearly Shingun. But if you look at Who improved the most from game one of this season to game 82, where the Rockets were when they left the court in L.A.? I would argue it's Cam Whitmore. He went from someone that I think most people around the Rockets thought was a year or two away, very raw, to a guy who by the end of the year was a very functional rotation player that I think we all have high hopes for next year. So Alfred and Shingun is definitely most improved player, don't get me wrong. But if you want to judge it by, you know, as I said, moving the goalpost, most improved player with an asterisk, if you will, let's give an honorable mention, I guess, to Cam Whitmore for being the most improved player from game one to game 82. I actually love that pick. And you, you I, I think to a, to a similar degree, you can make an argument for a Min Thompson as well. His in-season improvement, just because if things looked a little rough right out of the gate with a Min Thompson, like he, he looked like a rookie. And then when he came back, things were still a little rough. And then he, he gradually slid into that role where he just got more and more comfortable with each and every passing game to the point where he felt like a complete defensive Swiss army knife. And obviously Ime Odoka trusting him to insert him into the starting lineup. When once Alper and Shingun's injury happened, we debated, you know, here on the show, whether it was going to be, okay, what does he do? Right. Does he go with a Min? Does he, you know, do they play small with Jabari at the five or do they insert Jock Landale now that he's playing some decent basketball and, and obviously Emi Odoka had the trust in Amin Thompson a rookie to go out there and throw him into the starting lineup uh, and continue playing high level basketball but I love that pick for most improved player uh, I got to give it to Alpi though that's 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 got to be yeah. mine. I got I yeah, got to throw him I, a I bone somewhere because Same. you know if, if we can't give him MVP this year we got to give him something to recognize spoiler alert he's going to get something else at the end of this episode too but, oh yeah. there we go all right big big spoiler alert all right Last thing we got in this segment before we move on to our final segment and the final set of awards that we have, sixth man of the year. And this is an interesting one because mm. I don't think the Rockets had maybe your your prototypical, yep. your stereotypical sixth man of the year. You know, guy comes off the bench, spark plug, bucket getter, whatever. Cam kind of was that guy once he broke into the rotation later on in the season. 
Yeah. But I'm actually going to go with Jeff Green here for this one. Mm. I think Jeff was the most integral, integral bench piece for this Houston Rockets team. So even though he's not your sixth man in more of the traditional sense. I think he was clearly the most important bench piece for the Rockets, especially now if a Min Thompson had played the entirety of the season coming off the bench, I think it probably would have gone to a Min Thompson, but because he was injected into the Agreed. starting lineup and, and played about a quarter of the season as a starter, I'm going to move that award. I'm going to go with Jeff green for sixth man of the year. I'm actually going to go with Aaron holiday, similar logic to it's not going to be a young guy, even though, when they were at their peak, Amen, Cam, and Tari were all more important. At the same time, with Tari, it was injuries. With Cam, it was convincing Ime he was ready. With Amen, it was a combination of an injury early on, and then by the end of the year, he was a starter, so he was only off the bench for maybe half the season. When you look at guys that were actually consistently on the bench, Aaron is the one who really pops with a combination of a positive plus-minus differential and played 78 games. You could also make arguments for Jay Sean Tate and Jock Landale when you look at the uh, net rating. However, they both had issues convincing Ime Udoka that they were consistently viable players. Obviously, Tate fell out of the rotation late in the season, and Landale, coming back from the offseason ankle injury, wasn't consistently getting minutes until the second half of this season. So Holiday was the one guy of that positive trio of net rating difference maker. When you look at the bench statistically, that was out there throughout. He shot 39% on threes high volume relative to his minutes. He also was a very useful insurance policy in terms of ball handling for a rookie at Amin Thompson, who relative to expectations, Amin was much more of a front court player in year one than we thought. His handle still needs some work. You know, in the years ahead, hopefully Amin slides back into more of a point guard role. And we heard Emi Odoka say some nice things over the weekend about that. But in year one, Aaron Holiday was a vital insurance policy. And I'll also say kudos to um Rafael Stone, because it was really tricky to put those veteran bench spots together because when healthy, the Rockets bench was always going to give deference to guys like Amen, Cam, and Tari because they're not yet in all-out contention mode. They're still trying to develop these young prospects. So you needed bench guys like those three. We can throw Reggie Bullock into that mix as well. You needed guys that could play, that could step into larger roles when needed. The but stay, you also the needed guys... The crew. Shout out to Craig. Yeah, but you also need guys that weren't going to you know, create a fuss if they got a DNP CD or only played five to eight minutes. So I would say Jeff and Aaron both fall into that bucket and Rafael Stone did a nice job. You know, most people talk about Rafael talking about a men and cam or Fred and Dylan, the flagship signings, also the little guys getting guys that both could play yet weren't so established. They would, you know, cause trouble in the locker room, cause a ruckus. If they got an occasional DNP CD, that was really important. And I think both Aaron and, um, Jeff meet that criteria. The right, the right veteran personalities adding to kind of the the stew that was the Houston Rockets roster right. this season. All right, coming up, we got our final couple of awards. We're going to get to some non traditional awards here: the Unsung Hero Award and the Dog of the Year Award, as well as our LOR Player of the Year. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Look, I've been told that I'm a pretty competitive person, uh, and I'll be honest, I am a pretty competitive person. We all tend to have a bit of a competitive side, especially if you're a fan of sports, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure that you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly, where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money, but the absolute best part is messing with your friends. You can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now you can also rob their vaults of riches just for yourself, and the leaderboards show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is, so you get ultimate bragging rights. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in timed tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Again, download Monopoly Go, free on the App Store or Google Play Store. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Again, we want your thoughts on who the Houston Rockets season awards should go to. Let us know in the YouTube comments. I'll drop the template down there. You can copy, paste it, include your own thoughts about each award, each player, all that good stuff. We'll be on the lookout for those once this episode is published and available on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. All right, Ben, now... After your glowing praise to end the last segment, uh, I feel like you've taken some of the wind out of my sails for my pick for the Unsung Hero Award because it's going to be Aaron Holiday. Because, let's face it, Aaron Holiday was signed to be 
your third string, like injury insurance policy, you know, end of the bench veteran yeah. who was going to get spot minutes here and there. You know, obviously he was going to rack up a fair amount of DNPs, but six games into the season, Amin Thompson goes down with the ankle injury and the Rockets have to lean on Aaron Holiday very heavily. And yep. I think there's, we talked about this early on when it happened, but I think there was a legitimate argument to be made that Amin Thompson wasn't quite as ready to be an impactful piece to the same degree that Aaron Holiday was, both from... Just, At least not as a guard. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right? And, and that so, was the role, mm-hmm. yeah, at least initially. Yes, it was. And so Aaron Holiday steps in, right? He's a better shooter. He's more comfortable. He's an NBA veteran, right? He's been there, done that. He understands what the team needs of him. He kind of fit into that role a little bit better than Amin Thompson did right out of the gate because it was kind of like a square peg round hole situation with Amin. You wanted to get him the reps, but you didn't exactly have the wing minutes to give him when you had Dylan and Jabari and Tari and Jay Sean Tate and all these other guys that Emi Odoka was still trying to play. So... I think that Aaron Holiday throughout the season was a really important piece of this Houston Rockets team. He's not a guy that's going to, you know, be the blockbuster headlining guy. He's not going to win you any games single-handedly, although there were a couple performances this year that the Rockets probably don't walk away with wins without the production that they got from Aaron Holiday. So I think he was a huge pickup by the Rockets front office. Like you already said, I think he was the right type of veteran to add to this group. And uh, I also believe not only is he a part of the Stay Ready crew, I think he's a part of the No Chain crew as well, if I'm not mistaken. Him and I think Jock Landale, the No Chain crew. At least we're going to have to double-check with Craig and Ryan on that one, but I think he's part of the No Chain crew. Yeah, I think he is too. My unsung hero, I'm actually going with Jabari Smith Jr. Even though I do think that people are aware of him, I think sometimes his contributions fly under the radar because amongst the young core, he's not as flashy as certainly Shingun and Jalen. I would also argue Amin and Cam, even Tari to an extent. But when you look at Jabari year two relative to year one, so I think it was big for him just individually to shake off what was an underwhelming rookie year. True shooting went from... uh 51 point something last year to about 57% this year. Three point shooting was about 30 and a half last year. This year, 36 and a half on respectable volume. Uh, Rebounding was over eight per game. But I also think he was important within the construct of this team because of all the other front court injuries that you had. Shingun went down for the last 20 games. Tari only played 20 games. Jock Landil was not healthy until the second half of this season. So the fact that Jabari gave you 76 games and he gutted it out, he had some ankle issues this year, but he played in 76 of 82. And he was also able to not just play at power forward, but he played nearly a third of the season. You look at basketball reference, they logged him at 88% power forward last year, 12% center. This year, it was 68% power forward, 32% center. And he's a little thicker now than he was a year ago, but it's not dramatic. He's still undersized. And so it's not easy for him to bang with those NBA level starting centers. Yet that's what he had to do the last 20 games of this year. And it was a critical part of keeping the Rockets afloat because there weren't really any other options. Should mention that the one guy the Rockets traded for at the deadline, they think Steven Adams will help him a lot next year. And I do as well, but obviously he could not play this year. So that's another guy that's on your current roster that is unable to play due to injuries. So with all those front court injuries, Jabari, not just improving your one to year two and making you feel better about just his long-term trajectory, number three overall pick, that's important, yada, yada. But also with this particular team, having Jabari to soak up those front court minutes in a year where so many other front court guys were really struggling to stay on the floor, that was low-key important to the Rockets being able to grind out a 41 and 41 year. All right, Ben. This is the one. This is the. This is going to be the fun one because I I was trying to come up with some creative, uh, you know, non traditional season awards. So we've got the dog of the year. Coaches are dogs. All the players are dogs. I'm a dog. That's just what it is. Ben, who is your dog of the year for the Houston Rockets? For me, this is actually easy. It's Tari Eason. The guy played literally on a broken leg and showed incredible flashes. I know we haven't seen him since the calendar turned to 2024, but when you look at First off, the net rating, as you mentioned earlier, the plus minus was phenomenal. He was nearly plus 10 per game. So just in terms of the impact he made on winning, that was clear. But you look at the team success and how uh, Tari correlated to that. So the Rockets were 41 and 41 overall. The 22 games that Tari played, they were 12 and 10. Extrapolate that for a full season. That's a 45 win pace. That's basically the difference between the Rockets being at 500 and the Rockets being in the postseason. They're one Tari Eason away. And I think that's fair to say in a narrative sense, it also statistically played out that way. But then when you look at the 22 games that Tari Eason actually played, and again, it's pretty clear now he was playing on a broken leg that ultimately needed surgery, never recovered from what happened to him in 
the preseason, then there was the tumor attached to it. So of those 22 games, they beat the Nuggets, defending NBA champions three times. They beat the Pelicans twice. They beat the Lakers by more than 30. They beat the Thunder by nine. And then of the 10 losses, they lost most of these on the road to the Clippers, the Lakers, the Mavs, the Bucks, the Cavs, all upper echelon playoff teams. Well, except for the Lakers, but I think they're going to be in the playoffs. Those were road losses that were all extraordinarily close games. So if you look at that 12 and 10 and how that extrapolates, I would actually argue that based on the schedule, the Rockets performed at an even higher level when you look at the dominance they showed in some of those games against really good teams and then how competitive they were in those losses on the road against really good opponents. So I think in a narrative sense, Tari is the guy who takes the Rockets to that next level. And it's a shame we couldn't see him more for this season, but in just the dog of the year sense to gut it out for 22 games and leave us with so much optimism. Remember, Ime Udoka compared him to a young Kawhi Leonard. That is quite the comp. Ime Udoka does not throw out that stuff lightly. He showed a lot. The numbers bear it out. And then when you look at how the Rockets functioned as a team with Tari out there, I know it was just 22 games, but it just leaves you with with so much optimism, especially because, you know, so many of these young guys the Rockets have are dependent on the ball going in the bucket. Tari is someone who, you know, certainly he needs to make a few threes, but he's so good as a defender with his rebounding, with his motor, that he can succeed in other ways. And he's sort of like a Swiss Army knife. You talk about that with Amin Thompson's defense. Well, Tari Eason, can, you can just plug and play. In December, which was when Tari was healthiest, he was able to finish games in place of Jalen at the two, but... Honestly, he can finish games anywhere other than point guard. If Dylan or Jabari or even Shingun is having a bad night, you could put uh, Tari in a forward role and even slide Jabari up to center if that's what you need to do. Or if Dylan or Jabari are slumping with their shot as they did at times this year. There's just so much utility to Tari as a player, defensively, offensively. And I know it was just 22 games, but he left us feeling so good. And for him to do that, to play as well as he did on a broken leg, that is dog of the year stuff. He is easily, I think, the most significant blow that this Rockets team was dealt this season. Losing Tari, you know, was there, there's nobody that does what Tari can do on this Rockets roster, at least at the level at which he can do it. You talk about the versatility he provides, all that stuff, the defense, everything that Tari brings to this team. It, Amin is probably the next closest guy just from a sheer impact perspective, right? You talk about all these other guys, you know, guys who are bucket getters, guys who need to put the ball in the hoop to be really effective. Tari doesn't have to score to be effective. Amin doesn't have to score to be effective. Their defense can help carry a game. Their rebounding can help carry a game. Uh, Amin's playmaking can help carry a game. So I think having guys like that is, is integral to having a successful team. And yeah, Tari even, and here's my thing for Tari too. The embodiment of of the dog of the year award, right? Not only playing on a basically a broken leg, but also just keeping the the good vibes and the energy going from oh, the yeah. sidelines as well, going all the way up until the tail end of it, right? Calling out the Warriors, Warriors as the Rockets were breathing down their next leg, like all of that, right? That's Tari Eason to a T. So I, I fully agree. I think dog of the year, the first time we award the dog of the year, has to go to Tari Eason. We're gonna run it back one more time. Coaches are dogs. All the players are dogs. I'm a dog. That's just what it is. All right, and with that, that brings us to our final award, which is not an award that we're that we're picking, that we are anointing, that we are unilaterally here deciding. Uh, it's an award that I had to go back and count up and tabulate here, and that is throughout the season for m- the majority of post game recaps. There are a few where you know either you know I forget to mention it in the notes, or maybe it was just a really bad game and nobody deserved LOR player of the game from that one. But over the course of this Rocket season, I went back and looked at all the different games in which there was a locked on Rockets player of the game. So your locked on Rockets player of the year is none other than drum roll. Alperin Shingun, who walked away with the Player of the Game Award 25 times this season. Uh, the runner-up for Locked on Rockets Player of the Year was Jalen Green, who was awarded Locked on Rockets Player of the Game 19 times this season. So even though Shingun didn't walk away with the MVP award, he walked away with plenty of hardware from this episode. Yeah, absolutely. And I-, I think this goes into the discrepancy we talked about earlier between MVP and best player. Those aren't one in the same Shingun and to a slightly lesser extent, Jalen, those are your two guys that have a gear that right now no one else has. Now, we hope in future years, obviously, Amen, Cam, Jabari, Tari can show some flashes of that. But right now, all P and Jalen have an ability to get to a level when they are clicking as a scorer and a playmaker that other guys on this team, even your solid veterans, can't get to. And so when you 
sort of tally out player of the game awards, it doesn't surprise me that those two would lead the list. And certainly LP, who was playing at an all-star level earlier this season, that does not surprise me at all. With that said, for the season as a whole, there's other criteria that go into play. And so I think that's sort of the challenge for LP and Jalen moving forward is that, you know, it's not just what you are when you're at your peak, but it's also about finding ways to provide impact when you're not having everything going your way. And that's something that I think all P generally still does with his gravity. That's more of a challenge for Jalen, but I think it's something that he is going to stress on all of his young guys. And, you know, perhaps the men and Tari are the exceptions that you were saying earlier, because they already make an impact so much defensively, but that's going to be generally speaking, it's a challenge for every young player in the NBA. How do you make an impact when things aren't going your way on a given night? Do you check out or do you find ways to contribute in other ways and still provide value? That's what Fred Van Fleet did at a very high level this year. And that's something that you want other guys like LP, like Jalen, like all members of your young core to do more moving forward. How do you guys think we did with our Houston Rockets season awards? Give us your thoughts in the YouTube comments. Drop your own award ballots in the YouTube comments. Uh, as always, Ben, appreciate you and your time. Let everybody know where to track you down at. Yep, uh, Ben Dubose on Twitter, the Logger Line, the Rockets Wire on the same, and RocketsWire.usatoday.com for all your daily Houston Rockets news coverage. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a five-star review helps us out a ton. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. 